Hey film fans, I'd like to ask you a provocative question. Can a white filmmaker direct a movie that adequately depicts the lives of black people? This is the kind of question that gets people a little nervous. Some people might respond, artists make art and it shouldn't matter who the artist is or what their subject is as long as they go into it with integrity and honesty. That's how we should judge it. But one of the things we've learned from looking at Hollywood history is that the lack of access to filmmaking for women, for women of color, for men of color, Asian men, Asian women, native filmmakers, and so on, has limited the stories that can be told. On the flip side, the fact that the majority of Hollywood films have been directed by white men has meant that when the stories of people of color are told, they're told through a specific lens. So the question of whether a white director can adequately make such a film is not an obscene question. It's an important question. And it's one that I want to consider today by looking at the first film that was directed by Hal Ashby all the way back in 1970. It's The Landlord. And that's what we're going to talk about on this episode of What Makes This Film Great. <laughs> The Landlord is a 1970 film. It was a joint production of the Mears Corporation and United Artists, and as I said, it was directed by Hal Ashby. It's also one of the first films to feature the cinematography of Gordon Willis, who would go on to fame shooting the Godfather films, Alan Pakula's Paranoid Trilogy, and films in the late 70s like Annie Hall and Manhattan. Ashby wasn't even meant to direct the film. In the late 60s, Ashby was a film editor of some renown. He'd recently won an Academy Award for his editing on In the Heat of the Night, which I talked about in an earlier video that you can find here. Um, he had spent the late 60s working with the director Norman Jewison, and Jewison was slated to direct The Landlord. But he was given the opportunity to go and make Fiddler on the Roof, which was more of a passion for him. So he slotted Ashby into the director's role, and this is how Ash became to direct his first film. It features an excellent cast, including a young Bo Bridges as a protagonist, Elgar, and Lee Grant, who plays his mother with the panache that she brought to all of her roles around this time, and an amazing cast of African-American actors, including Pearl Bailey, Marky Bay, Diana Sands, Lou Gossett Jr., and one of my favorite performances, Melvin Stewart as Professor Dubois. It's important also to note the black talent behind the making of the film. The Landlord's based on a novel by Kristen Hunter, an African-American writer, who has said that her intention in writing her novels, and she wrote several novels in her life, was to look at race relationships. And she used the term with an objective eye. So she always wanted to depict black life in America truthfully, but she also wanted to, according to her, depict their interactions with white Americans truthfully. So while there's a political component to her novels, the agenda is one of, how can you put this? Her agenda was about um, depicting reality as she saw it rather than depicting or dismantling the political structures behind that reality. The screenplay was written by Bill Gunn, another black writer. Bill Gunn was a playwright who would go on to make several films himself, experimental films, including Ganja and Hess, which I'll talk about in the next video. And Bill Gunn worked closely with Ashby on the script. It was their desire to adapt Hunter's novel the best they could and stay true to the novel, but also to give it a cinematic flair. And there's quite a bit of cinematic flair to this film, and I'll get to that in a moment. So I think one of the things to consider when we think about is Hal Ashby equipped to tell this story is that in some ways that's a very auteurist driven question, as if the director of the film is the only guiding hand in the telling of the tale. And if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know I'm quite skeptical of this idea that the director is the only creative voice or the only authorial voice on a film. And Ashby held that belief as well. Ashby resisted throughout his career the auteur label. So when you have a director working with a black novelist 
whose work is being adapted by a black playwright, then the question of whose voice is dominating becomes very interesting. Now Ashby made the film he wanted to make and you can go back and read interviews with him where he talks specifically about shot selection, about the story he wanted to tell and so on. But I've read a lot of letters between Ashby and Gunn and they actually tried to write another script together after The Landlord because their collaboration was quite fruitful for both of them. And Ashby really relied on Gunn to craft the story that he then went on to direct. So that's one thing to keep in mind when we talk about The Landlord. Another thing to keep in mind is a decision that Ashby made early in production. The film is shot in the Park Slope neighborhood of Brooklyn. And it's a very different Park Slope in 1970 than the one you might know today. And one of the film's critiques is a critique of gentrification. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the plot in just a second. But the production decision Ashby made was to move the cast and crew from Manhattan, where the Mirish company was paying for them to stay, into Park Slope. So during the Brooklyn components of the shoot, they were living in this neighborhood. And there are a lot of stories about their interaction with the locals, not all of them positive. Some of the locals were quite wary of a white, predominantly white film crew coming into their neighborhood to tell stories about where they lived. But cast and crew alike have talked about how that experience of living in the environment that they were shooting changed the way that they thought about the story. So obviously <laughs> Ashby bringing his cast and crew into Park Slope is not going to make white people think black, whatever that might mean, but it was an effort on his part to ground the filmmaking process, at least to a certain extent or as best he could within the world that they were trying to capture on film. So as we consider how successfully this film is at depicting the lives of its characters, those are just some background things to keep in mind that Ashby's never gonna stop being white William Hal Ashby. But as a filmmaker, he was dedicated to the process of um, bringing as much of an authenticity as he could to the filmmaking. The plot of The Landlord is pretty simple. It concerns Elgar Enders. Elgar is a rich, white New Yorker who lives out on Long Island. Probably his family's money is derived from Manhattan, but this is at a time, 1970, when there's been a lot of white flight or so-called white flight from the cities. And now they live in this sprawling, beautifully manicured estate on Long Island. Elgar is looking for independence from his family. He feels like their old-fashioned values are not what he aspires to anymore. And so what does he do <laughs> to prove that he's switched on? He buys an entire building in Park Slope. Why? To improve it? To improve the lives of the people who live there? No. To evict everyone who lives in the apartment and convert it into a single family dwelling for himself. He's gonna, as he says, tear out the whole ceiling around the staircase and put in a giant chandelier. So his whole intention is one of gentrification, one of an extremely racist gentrification, because as the film begins, while Elgar comes across as lighthearted, he doesn't seem to be malevolent or spiteful, but that's because he has absolutely no critical facilities about his own actions or the effects of those actions. So this act of buying the brownstone to Elgar is one of rebellion against his old fashioned traditional family, where at the same time, it's one of aggression towards the black residents who live in the building. Throughout the first half of the film, Elgar slowly gets to know the tenants in the building. And these are very interesting characters. Diana Sands, Fanny, is married to Lou Gossett Jr.'s Copy, and they're trying to raise their son together. Copy, we don't get to know a lot about his background, but he's a kind of militant 
activist, he's young, he's very distrustful of the landlord and gets in his face as soon as he shows up. I'm Elgar Anders, the new landlord. You, you, the new landlord. Yes. You're the, the new just, landlord, man. Uh, the new landlord, man. You don't shake my hand, man. Hey. 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 I just want to go over man. I'll take your flower in the house. I'll take your flower in the house. I'm going to take your flower in the house. Could you put it down right there? We go in the house. Whereas Fanny is a little bit more um, approachable. She thinks the landlord's interesting. She wants to get to know him better. Look, why don't we go down to my place so we can discuss this at length? Pearl Bailey's Marge is kind of like a mother figure for the building. She confronts the landlord when he first shows up with a shotgun. Hold it right there, monkey. Who's that? Now turn around and march your buns back out that door before I shoot them out from under you. Are you crazy? Why are you pointing that at me? Because my horoscope told me that evil was coming to my door today. And March, here it is. So get moving or else you ain't gonna have no hip on. You dig? No, lady, I own this house. I'm the new landlord. And I'm a rim kid. Move it! And if you're a landlord, how come you ain't got no door keys? No, I, uh... I have door keys. You know, you look like a rapist to me. You got funny eyes. We have Professor Dubois, who's also a militant, but more of a kind of philosophical militant, whose job he considers it to be to educate the children in the neighborhood about black history in America, uh, white supremacy in America, uh, teaching them kung fu and, and martial arts so that they can uh, defend themselves against racist police. Hey, Dubois, what's happening? Hey, Fanny, Kofi in trouble with the pigs again? No, this ain't no pig this time, sugar. This is the new landlord. Landlord, Professor Dubois. Professor Dubois, how do you do? <laughs> I swear he thinks the Lord put white people on this earth as a punishment. Cause I don't hold with no sacrilegious talk like that. So there's a, a cast of characters there. And while in the service of this video, I can only sort of give a few details of their personality. They're all quite well rounded. They interact with each other and different ways. There's not one face on the building where each of these characters are sort of uh, a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Some of them trust each other, some of them don't. You can tell there's a history to the building. And this is what Elgar enters thinking that he's just going to sort of clean house, not realizing that what he's going to do is disrupt all of these people's lives. Meanwhile, early in the film, Elgar meets Lanny, played by Marky Bay, and Lanny is um, a light-skinned woman. Well, my mother's Irish, my uh, father's black, and uh, they got divorced when I was uh, 16 years old. And the court said I should spend the winters with my father when I was going to school. And in the summer, I uh, lived with my mother. So in the summer, I was white, and, and in the winter, I was black. God, what did that do to you? I got very wise. And Elgar falls in love with her. She doesn't live in the building. She works in a club in the neighborhood. And so all of these things are going on in Elgar's life while back out on Long Island, his mother, played by Lee Grant fantastically, is constantly pestering him to get over this project. Um, to leave those people behind. She's concerned about his safety. And her language throughout is just laden with barely veiled racist tropes, sometimes not even veiled, um, stereotypes and epithets that she uses to needle and conjole her son because she feels like he's slipping away from her. Uh, we're going for a drive. Something's come up. Elga. A lot of these people, not all, mind you, there's good black people as well as good white people. I've always taught you that. 
but some, mind you, live to set traps for rich white women. I'm not a rich white woman, Mother. I know that, dear. I, I didn't mean that. You know I didn't mean that. It's just, Elgar, didn't we all go together to see Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Yeah. It's just, Elgar, you have to realize all Negroes are not like that. In all of this, there's a lot going on. There's elements of counterculture, there are elements of black militancy, which was on the rise in the late 60s and into the 70s. There is one of the first real depictions, I think, of interracial romance and also interracial sex in a Hollywood film. There's also the dynamic of how light-skinned and darker-skinned black people interact with each other. And, and some of those scenes happen with Elgar not even around. Tiny leaf perfume, lipstick, anything like that around, man. You know, it's like nobody sees it. I don't understand it. Chicks just go blind. Try uh, Miss Thing. She had a date last night. Miss Thing, you see my perfume? Uh, I think we ought to uh, check her pocketbook, man. No, I don't think you better check my pocketbook. Uh, still, get this pocketbook to me. Get her still? Listen, you raggedy-ass black bitch. Don't you mess with me. Let me tell you something, you high yellow heifer. You have to get a lot blacker and a lot badder to stand there and call me a black bitch. Get something straightened out, honey. Cause you got yourself one of them little blue-eyed wonders don't mean a fucking thing to me. And so within the film, there's, a, there's actually a lot going on that's in this kind of coming of age buildings roman or something like that about Elgar coming just barely to a sort of political consciousness. Just barely. This is not a film in which Elgar wakes up and is like, oh, I get it. The race struggle, the class struggle. I figured it out and now I'm going to be a good boy. It's not that. On the flip side, it's also important to point out that Elgar is in no way and comes nowhere close to being some sort of white savior. He's a doofus from beginning to end. He's saving nobody and in fact he very clearly damages the lives of at least two of the tenants in his building. So a lot of the tropes about white and black interaction that we've come to expect from Hollywood films are absent or are, are very subtle or downplayed in this film. Um, if you've seen it and you disagree with me, I'd love to hear in the comments because I know where my perspective is coming from, of course, when I make these claims. So I'd love to hear someone who has a different perspective on the film talk about it below. As I mentioned, the film is shot by Gordon Willis, and that's a very important part of the film's formal approach to the story. If you've seen my video on In the Heat of the Night, you know that I talk about how Haskell Wexler decided to shoot that film and how he decided to light Sidney Poitier. In the Heat of the Night was one of the first Hollywood films where a black actor was lit appropriately so that he, his features, his expressions, his gestures would appear on screen. So he wasn't just lit the same way that white actors had been lit for the previous hundred years. Gordon Willis takes a different approach and he later became known as the Prince of Darkness and one of the reasons for that is because of his ability or acuity to shoot in low light. And what he and Ashby did here, and this could be a questionable tactic, this is another thing I'd love to hear what people think about below, is they decided to shoot the Long Island scenes very brightly lit. And when we're out on Long Island at Elgar's house, when we see him interacting with his mother, we get scenes like this. Uh, I've invested in real estate. Do it. You have invested in real estate? Oscar. Oscar. Yes, yes, yes. Oscar. Yes, Oscar. Yes, uh, Oscar. Yes. Yes. Darling, listen. Will yes. you forgive me? Yes. Yes. Oscar, I promise yes. you, we'll dance our brains out tomorrow at 10. 10, 10 o'clock, without interruption. It's practice. I will. <laughs> ciao. Ciao, darling. Uh -huh. Insufferable dance goddess. On the flip side of that, they decided to shoot the Park Slope scenes very dark in low lighting. And so we get scenes like this. What are you going to do? 
know what I'm gonna do, Elgar. I just don't know, so leave me alone. Hey, what happened? Something happened? What's the matter? You gonna tell me what's wrong? The effect of that is that in a lot of the scenes, the black characters are lit or underlit and appear perhaps even darker than normal or darker than they might in standard lighting on screen. This is in a way the opposite to what Haskell Wexler did on In the Heat of the Night. The intentions behind this, and Willis and Ashby have both talked about this quite a bit, was that they wanted to heighten the difference, visually heighten the difference between the affluence, the brightness, the open aired nature of the Long Island scenes with the, the dimness and the sort of entrapped feeling of the poverty in the Park Slope scenes. And they were insistent on this. When the Mirishes saw the dailies, they wanted the Park Slope scenes to be reshot. They kept saying, we can't see their eyes. This is a comedy. We need to see their eyes. And Ashby and Willis were like, no, we don't. The whole point of the way we're shooting like this is we want the film form or the film style to imply the suffocating nature of sort of ghetto-based poverty. And this is an area where I think we could talk about, does that work? Is that patronizing? Is that in itself, in using the characters that way, if not racist, at least less enlightened approach than it seems? I think it works, but maybe I'm wrong about this, and I'd love to hear what you think. The film has a lot of in-your-face elements. This is Ashby's first film as a director, and he included a lot of what we might call sort of postmodernist elements. Um, there are flashbacks, there are cutscenes where we see Elgar as an adult in his primary school classroom interacting with the teacher. There's a lot of sort of meta cinematic devices here. One of the most interesting ones comes in the party scene. There's a rent party that Marge throws in honor of the new landlord where she invites all of the tenants and she invites Elgar. And Elgar is the only white person in attendance at this party. And he drinks and they dance. And apparently when you're watching the dancing scenes, Ashby just encouraged everyone to drink and they put on music and he asked everyone to dance and they just filmed it. And it wasn't choreographed or anything. But then we get a scene in the middle where several of the tenants, many of whom don't show up in the rest of the film, confront Elgar. And I just wanna show you that scene. Black. 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 Black, baby. Black. Baby, black is a whole new thing. And you are going to have to reckon with it. Is it a fad, though? See, that's the thing. Man, that is not the thing. It's like you got a mole, dig? You got a mole right here. <laughs> And you do anything to get rid of this mold. Because everybody that doesn't have moles has got you to believe like it's real ugly. So you'd do anything? I mean, you'd hide your face. Anything. Walk in backwards. Anything. you do everything. I mean, anything. Then one day. One day. One day. Moles are in. Moles are in. People are getting out their eyebrow pencils, marking them on, and you got one naturally right in the middle of your forehead. You're gonna know what pride is for the first time, baby. For the first time! You whitey screaming about miscegenation? <laughs> and you done watered down every race you ever hated. This is not the only political scene in the film. There are a lot of scenes where Professor Dubois confronts the 
landlord Elgar directly about his privilege and how he's acting from a place of privilege. He doesn't use that term, but that's exactly what he's talking about. But this is the most kind of aggressively political because of the way that it breaks the fourth wall and because of its sort of non-naturalistic scenario where we have several different characters performing a singular monologue. In fact, there's a very similar scene in Haskell Wexler's Medium Cool, and of course Ashby and Wexler were close friends, and I, and I feel like this scene was probably influenced by the similar scene in Medium Cool. But I think for a film from 1970, to include this scene, and to include the line, you keep talking about miscegenation, and the only thing you, the only thing you've ever done is watered down the people you come in contact with. That's an incredible thought to put on a United Artists screen in 1970. And one of the things that happened to this film was that when the Mirishes finally saw it, reportedly they loved it as a film, but they didn't know how to market it. So they marketed it as a sex comedy. And you get this infamous poster of the finger going through the, the two, um, Doorbells. So people who went to see it as a comedy were kind of blown away by this, the, these politics, and they didn't respond well, right? And the film sort of came and went. It got some pretty good reviews. Roger Ebert liked it all right. A few other critics liked it all right. But it kind of came and went, and so I don't think it ever got the discussion it deserved. Even if that discussion leads down the road to nice try but fail, or even further down the road to, this is still white, racist white crap. It's a film that I think deserves that kind of discussion and it didn't get it. And a scene like this I think is, is fascinating in Hollywood history to think that it would have come out in 1970. Returning to that finger in the two doorbells and the, the, the zany sex comedy that the mirror should try to market this as, the plot really takes a turn when Elgar goes home one night with Fanny. In fact, it's after the rent party. And Kopi is away from home and Elgar's drunk a lot and he's been sick and Fanny's kind of mothering him. She takes him to her apartment and they end up sleeping together and Fanny gets pregnant. And it's not a sex comedy at all. And we have a situation where Elgar and Fanny have got together, but he's already in a burgeoning relationship with Lanny. And of course, Fanny's married to Kopi. And this, the way this falls out is not typical love triangle or love quadrangle. There's a tragedy involved. Kopi kind of goes crazy when he finds out about this and threatens Elgar with violence, which has drastic consequences for him. But also Fanny's pregnant with a baby that she doesn't want to have and she's poor, and this is 1970, she's not gonna get an abortion, and even if she had access to that uh, in New York, she doesn't have the money for it. And to Elgar, who I've said is daft and dim-witted throughout most of the movie, it doesn't even occur to him to offer that solution. Now, maybe the film doesn't wanna go down that route. It's already got enough balls in the air. Um, but there's nothing kind of sex comedy about this, and the, the decision of Fanny to have the baby and her decision, and there's a little bit of a spoiler coming here, but her decision to give the baby to Elgar leads to one of the most poignant and touching, but also biting scenes in the film. Do you think it would be all right if I put it up for adoption? I guess so. Well. That's what I'm gonna do. I want one thing, though. What's that? 
I want him adopted as white. Why? Because I want him to grow up casual. Like his daddy. I just love the use of that word casual there. It just gets to so much of Elgar's personality throughout the film. Casual. And it gets to so much, I think, of the question about white cinema and black characters throughout Hollywood history. And maybe this film is a byproduct of that as well. I'm inclined not to think so. I have a soft spot for Ashby um, and I could be wrong. But I, I think this film, by including lines like that, by including the party monologue, is trying to puncture that casualness in ways that if there, it's not a radical film, but that at least are thought provoking in ways that most depictions of black Americans in the 60s and 70s, at least as crafted by white directors, were not. I should say this film is also a lot of fun. There are hilarious scenes. Some of them um, depict Elgar's parents who are, you know, barely even sort of ironically racist in the way that they interact with uh, the help at their house or at a, an insane costume party that they all go to. But there are also sort of more touchingly humorous scenes, like a great one when Lee Grant, Elgar's mother, and Pearl Bailey, uh, Marge, two acting powerhouses have a wonderful scene where they get drunk together. And it's just one of the, the great performances you'll see from this era of two women just having a fantastic time on screen. Listen, now, 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 now don't you worry about the baby. I'll make the drapes and I'll get the material. Won't charge nothing like the decorator. God, I don't know how to thank you. Here. Oh, uh, Here, take this charger plate, honey. Get mm. what you need. Just uh, take a swatch of that material and get what you want. Mm. I'm going home. God, wherever that is. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me wrap up a couple of these ham hocks for you. Oh, uh, no. I just you know, put them in my bag. Yeah, all right, man. Seem to enjoy them so much. Here, yeah, take three. I got plenty more. Stay cool, Mark. Mm -hmm. Can you make it down? Stay cool. The film also features an amazing soundtrack. There's a great story to this that I won't go into too much detail about, but Ashby had Neil Young committed to do a soundtrack for the film, and it was going to be about 50% already recorded music and 50% of new tunes that Neil Young was going to record for the film, but United Artists wouldn't pay for Young to do it, and there's a great letter that Ashby writes to Norman Jewison where he rants and rants and rants about these fuckers who are trying to ruin his movie and how you know, he's never going to let the money men have control over his movie again, which unfortunately they do for almost all of his movies throughout his career. But the result of not getting young is kind of a benefit to the film. The, the music was overseen by Al Cooper, who was a sort of presence throughout the 60s recording with Dylan and the Rolling Stones and a lot of other people and Cooper composes a lot of the score for the film but he also gets the Staples family singers to sing songs on the soundtrack and that combination of his kind of soulful score and the Staples family songs I don't know if a Neil, a Neil Young soundtrack would have done it better. In short, this is a really fantastic film. It's, it's drastically underseen and I highly recommend it. It's a thought-provoking, envelope-pushing film. And it's surprising to me that it was underseen at the time, although maybe that it shouldn't be because it doesn't slot easily into any sort of generic box and it is pushing certain envelopes. But I wonder if younger eyes or the eyes of black viewers or the eyes of non-Americans maybe um, might see the film differently. So this is a film I'd really love to hear your comments if you've seen it before, what you think about it, um, if you think I got it wrong, or any of the scenes or, or aspects of the film that you love that I didn't get a chance to mention. 
That's all for now, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. As usual, I would love it if you'd hit the subscribe bell, hit the like button, leave a comment. Just let me know that you're out there watching and that you'd like to see more content like this on the channel. In the meantime, however, my name is Aaron Hunter. Keep watching movies.